Hi everyone and welcome to my channel called Zuzana Reacts where I learn all things Parat with your help and I just share my Slovak Central European point of view. Now in today's video we are going to look into Sadhguru. It's going to be a long podcast that I'm going to review. I know many of you have asked me to look at the long format so this is it. I'll see what happens in the end if I edit it in multiple videos or so. But maybe I'll just try to do it uh, just in one go and, and let's see how you guys feel about it. And today we're going to look at Sanatana Dharma and Spirituality by Sadhguru. I'm quite, quite interested. You know, I love spirituality a lot. Um, obviously, we have all our own interpretation of spirituality. And I think for me, it means that uh, I just really see it as just be in a simplistic way, uh, kind to people around you. So before we get into the video, please like this video and click on the subscribe button and turn on the notification. Thank you so much for your support. Right. So let's get us started i am beyond excited the greatest crime committed on this planet is the idea of heaven you're looking at the calendar images that kind of yogis they're they're artists work the yogis were never like that you look at adyogi the first yogi mm. the most exuberant and athletic human being you can find journalists particularly they come to the yoga center one film star or one minister somebody is there their focus is only that there are other 30000 40000 other people your cameras never caught them. I've never gone to any politician, any powers that be, including God, asking for something. I've never prayed in my life. Right now, people are talking about mental health pandemic. I know this will get me heavy trolls, but I must say this to them. If you do not understand, your physical and mental health is your responsibility. One important thing Indians have been lacking is that we've always been accused of not having strategic thinking. The world is looking at us as one of the greatest possibilities on the planet. We are a civilization who strategized thousand years later what we will be doing at one time. People call me Sadhguru according to their experience. So I'm telling you my problems, I will die as a failure, I know that. But I'm a blissful failure. <laughs> Namaste Jehin. welcome to another edition of ANI Podcast with Smita Prakash. I have a sore throat and an allergy cough. But I didn't cancel my schedule. I didn't re try to reschedule the shoot because of what my guest had said last year to a podcaster. He said that despite having serious ailments like typhoid and malaria, he never canceled a shoot, not the thousands of them that he had scheduled. You must have guessed by now who my guest is, Sadhguru. Sadhguru Jagdish Vasudev, a yoga guru, mystic, philanthropist, and author of dozens of books, a podcaster, he has millions of followers around the world. Sadhguru has been awarded the Padma Vibhushan, the second highest civilian award, for his contributions to spirituality and humanitarian services. Sadhguruji Pranam. Namaskaram. Namaskaram. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on our podcast. I'm very honored that you're here. Uh, a whole host of topics that I want to speak. I spoke to you about a year ago. Uh, we were just coming out of, uh, you know, the pandemic at that stage. So most of my questions were about how to cope with grief and what tools we can, um, you know, we can employ and your guidance on that, on how we can come out of it. But um, today, you know, um, I want to ask you so much more. Uh, I heard your, because I heard this interview that you did with Joe Rogan. <laughs> and I really, really like that podcast. Joe is a wonderful guy. He's one of those guys who, whoever comes to him, he lets them speak. He understands he need to ask questions and wait uh, for people to find expression. It's not a children's school kind of thing. It's very nice that way. But even his questions on mysticism and all that. Um... Unfortunately, I could not address his uh, inquiries about mysticism because that was just pre-Safe Soil movement. Mm -hmm. I went there mainly for that purpose, to create support for that. So I kind of avoided those things <laughs> because, you know, people make controversies of all these things. <laughs> yeah, but still, uh, I think uh, you explained uh, many questions which, you know, uh, people who don't understand much about what is the difference between spirituality, between being religious, between seeking, between knowing, you you kind of explained that beautifully in that. Uh, so those who haven't seen it, please log on. And it's a very long one. You can get it on Spotify. But of course, today, uh, you know, in that in, uh, podcast, you spoke about the concept of heaven. Um, <laughs> in all religions, there is a concept of heaven. In many of you know, many people feel that this uh, life is a preparation for the next life. But if you speak, say that to the children today, they look and say, what? Nonsense. That's not true. See, the greatest crime committed on this planet is the idea of heaven. Because the moment you tell someone, this is not the place to live well. There's another place where you're going to go and live well. 
It's a crime against humanity. Really? Wow. It is. Because you're making sure people don't live well here. They'll wait to live well elsewhere. Hmm. I'm asking, do you have any proof that you're not already in heaven and making a mess out of it? <laughs> yeah, there isn't. Or hell. Uh, that's up to you. So essentially, human experience can be either like heaven or like hell. Hmm. So people say, they come to the yoga center and say, Oh, Sadhguru, you've created a heaven. I said, don't say that. This is planet Earth and it's the most beautiful place that we know. Don't say that another place is there which is more beautiful than this, which is better than this. This is because you're living badly. You think there's another place where you will go and live well. All the sort of people that they say they went to heaven, I don't want to be in their company. <laughs> yeah, true. I know, but you know... Wow, this is, this is very, very interesting and I kind of agree with him. Uh, on this one, I, you know, there are also many songs uh, where uh, they sing like the heaven is uh, a place on earth. And yeah, love it. Oh, uh, you're talking about thousands of years of prophets and gurus and yogis who have been telling us. No, that... no, no. Don't blame the yogis. Yogis never talked about going to heaven. Yeah. It is only the heaven idea is a very Western idea. When I say Western, I'm talking West Asian idea. <laughs> oh, Okay. Otherwise, uh, there is no heavenly business here. Here, you've always been told your life is your karma and you have to make it happen the way you make it happen. And uh, there is a possibility of life being cyclic, cyclical and you can transcend the cycles if you wish or you can go through the cycles. Mm. Nobody said you're going to heaven and permanently be there in one place. I'm saying, suppose uh, I will send you to the most beautiful resort on the planet, but we will pick at it in such a way that you can't cross it. You have to live there only forever, not for your lifetime, forever. You think it'll be great? It'll be just like any prison, all right? True. So this is the idea of heaven. It's supposed to be very beautiful, but once you go there, there's no way out. <laughs> I don't want yeah. to go there. <laughs> yes. That brings me to one question which I was going to ask later. You, you're one of those uh, who has broken stereotypes, you know, of a, of a guru, of a yogi, of a mystic person who, uh, you know, extricates himself from the worldly uh, life. You you dance, you sing, you play golf, you motorcycle, you travel the world, you wear lovely clothes. Is it lovely? It is. It Thank is very pretty. Thank you. <laughs> you. You seem to... I uh, designed my own clothes. I want you to know. Okay. <laughs> it's from natural fiber, I can see. Yes. That's a part of my mission, Save the Weave, is one of the projects that we're doing okay. to bring back natural fiber because one of the worst kind of pollutions that's happening is because of the clothing. Oh. Like they say, an average American has about 28 grams of uh, polyuthrin in their body. Ah. And this is one of the biggest causes for cancer and things like that. And uh, fashion industry is the third largest polluter on the planet. So these things are happening and nobody looks... I actually thought that the fashion industry was the number one polluter in the world. I said it because everybody is focused on something that's visible. It is the smoke that comes out of the automobile that everybody is interested in. Everybody is interested in that lowly plastic bag which is floating around. Mm. I'm not saying they should not be fixed. But especially in Western countries, and it's become true in our country also now, nearly 90% of the clothes that children wear are polyuthrene. 92% of the world's fiber is polyuthrene already. Non-biodegradable. Yes. And uh, when children wear this, especially when children wear this, before 15 years of age, if they wear this polyuthrene clothing, uh, any kind of uh, synthetic clothing, they get poisoned. So you are wondering why somebody is autistic, why this and that. If I say this, oh, where is the research, where is the fact? I'm saying, see, you will find facts after there are mis massive numbers of people, right? The fact is, we know what it does. We know it enters your bloodstream. We know it's entered the soil. We know it's entered the water. We know it's entered our food cycle. We know it's in the air. So, one of the important things, I've been pushing this with the governments, to at least school children, make it that they're wearing either cotton natural or fibers. linen or anything, okay, mm -hmm. which is natural. It'll make a huge difference. At least the government schools make it, but it's still not happened. Everybody's using terry cotton, terlin and whatever. It's not so much because it is cotton and five, ten percent. This thing, it's okay, I would say, because it uh, demands less maintenance. But a time has come when the richest people in the world are wearing crumply clothes once again. <laughs> you know, in California, I'm in somebody's house who's really up there in the movie thing and all that. <laughs> so when I go, our volunteers ask, uh, is there an iron box? I say, what? This is not a kind of house where we'll have an iron box. Iron box is an insult. It's for those kind of steamsters. Permanent press, <laughs> permanent press clothes, right? No, no, they're not pressed. They all wear crumply Crumpled. clothes. Ah. Ah, because that's fashionable. That's the most expensive clothing. Linen so when is. there is a fashion like that, 
we must all get into little crumply clothes. It's all right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm also into a little bit of crumply clothes. So, but uh, <laughs> my question stays, uh, Sadhguruji, that you've yeah. broken stereotypes. Yeah. See, the thing is, when you say stereotype, where did your stereotype come from? You're looking at the calendar images of those, uh, you know, long bearded, constipated look on their face, that kind of yogis. They're, they're artists' work. The yogis were never like that. You look, you look at Adiyogi, the first yogi. Mm. He's the most exuberant and athletic human being you can find. You look at all the gods that you have in this country. If they don't dance, they cannot be gods in our country. Non-dancing god, not allowed in this culture. <laughs> a man who cannot dance, how can he be even a human being? Forget about being a god. <laughs> dancing with ecstasy because of spiritual... Yes, it is with... not just some trained dancing. See, dance is like laughter. Hmm. When, you're, when you're bubbling with joy, you laugh, all right? It's not like you're trained to laugh. Naturally, it comes to you. It's not that somebody has to tell you a joke. Life is funny. If you look at it carefully, it's very, very funny. If you look at it in the surface, it's dead serious. But if you look at it carefully enough, it's quite funny mm. how people come, do all this, and tomorrow morning they disappear, mm. and everything is fine, <laughs> all right? It's quite funny. So if you see on one level, you will laugh. When your body wants to laugh, it will dance. It's, it's a consequence of exuberance. It is not some special kind of dance you have to do. This joy and exuberance, you feel... Hi, I was just stopping about, uh, right there for a second. I really like how he talking, talk, talks about life as a something that's very funny and something also very serious. And I think he's very spot on. And I think it just talks about that dichotomy of life. But let's continue. It's very much part of uh, Indian culture. Or... No, it's part of life. It's part of... it's part of life. Life is exuberant. You just look at this. Hmm. Children below, that is also unfortunately it's happening. 12, 13 year old children are depressed and committing suicide, all these things unfortunately, it's the worst thing that can happen to humanity. But you look at any child anywhere in the world, being exuberant is natural. Look at a butterfly, look at a grasshopper, look at anything. Everything is exuberant. What went wrong with you is just this. You became dead serious about life. You're dying to live. <laughs> People are dying to live. What That's for? a very in-depth <laughs> statement. You, you're alive anyway. Yeah. And... Uh, when you really look at it, how long are you alive if you look at this, even if you live to be hundred? But what potential a human being carries, it's too little, if you explore the potential. Otherwise, it may feel very long. I mean, in your own experience, you can look back and see any given day, on a day when you're very joyful, twenty-four hours, poof, it goes away like a moment. Someday, if you're a little frustrated or anxious or depressed about something, then twenty-four hours feels like a eon of time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This is because only miserable people can have a long life. <laughs> Are Indians miserable by nature? Not at all. So you, the reason I'm asking Sadhguruji is because recently there was some uh, happiness, something that came out. Happiness, the happiness studies, nonsense, that is all. See, I travel everywhere in the world. Everywhere we go, at least Western societies, if you go to Africa and all, it's different. But Western societies, if you travel, they are at many notches above us in terms of material comfort and, you know, their uh, whatever is organization of life. But they will all in the evening, so it's becoming like that. But when I land in India, you will see many more smiles, brighter smiles, natural ones, not trained ones, mm. simply bursting out. So when you were a child, at the age of five, if you were so joyful, by the time you were thirty, you should have become ecstatic if you were growing. But unfortunately, the reverse happens simply because your psychological drama overtakes the existential reality of life. Otherwise, if you pay attention to anything, a flower can engage you for the rest of your life, a leaf can engage you for the rest of your life. Why, if you pay attention, one atom can engage you for the rest of your life. It's so complex and fantastic. What makes you ecstatic? <laughs> I've seen you, at the video went viral everywhere. You were ecstatic when you were dancing. There was so much joy. What made you feel that at that moment? I'm... Uh, I was not at that moment. I'm like that every moment. Hmm. I must tell you this. Because you've heard all this, I don't know what to speak to you and what not. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> <laughs> See, this is... I'm going to tell you my problems now, okay? Well, I don't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> huh. At least look, uh, listen I to should listen with to a grave it. face. Some gravity is needed. Grave okay. face. Right. This is the problem. People think if something important has to be handled, it has to be they must be grave. No. Grave means you must be in the earth. You shouldn't be outside. You have no business <laughs> to be sitting here and being grave. You must be in the grave, isn't it? Right. So, I'm, you know, I'm going about my life. Initially, I go through from the age of 12, I start practicing yoga just for physical progress, and it definitely set me apart physically and mentally. Then uh, by the time I'm twelve, thirteen, I'm a very... Uh, by then I've read, uh, you know, Das Capital and Engels and stuff and everything. I'm fully fired up, wanting to join the 
armed revolution. Oh my God. <laughs> because uh, my thing is uh, injustice. I see injustice in politics, I see injustice in the economic situation, I see injustice in religious things that are happening, mm -hmm. I see injustice within the family, I see injustice everywhere. Mm -hmm. So I'm… I'm simply angry all the time, not against anybody. I'm simply angry all the time because wherever I see, I see prejudice and in injustice. So in that anger, I thought armed revolution is the only way out. At that time, it was boiling everywhere in southern India. Seventies, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It was boiling a lot, so we wanted to become part of it. I almost was on the verge of it. Their own corruption saved me. Then I went there and then I saw they were also f full of corruption. The corruption they were supposed to fight, they were even more corrupt. Then I backed off, where am I going, you know? Yeah. So... Also, right here, it's very interesting what he's saying, because this is what I've been... I don't want to say internally battling, but I... After university, I wanted to go and study, uh, like, international relations and maybe politics. But when I looked at... There was a year when I was in Slovakia, when I was, like, reading all the magazines, and I realized how how everything actually really is, because if you continue studying something for a long time, you start to see patterns, you start to see trends for yourself, and you see like who who is really pulling the strings, let's say, in, in the country. And that just really hit me. And what I realized that it, there is there's no point in, in, in politics entertaining, at least for me, right? Like it, it may be calling for someone else. Um, because I feel like you you are unable to change anything because of the forces that are really behind the scenes. So I then completely stopped and I decided that I don't want to be watching anything with politics because it is a negative and B I don't I, I don't want to you know uh, focus and be angry what uh, Sad Guru had mentioned. Uh, I want to live happy life. And that is where my complete shift. And even though like I've been studying it since I was like early teenagers, spirituality and, and mind and subconscious mind, etc. But then it just reinforced within me that this is absolutely not the way in the way spirituality. But but it's it but then in a way, if you are let's say spiritual in a way that you know you want to see and let's simplify spirituality, like I said at the start of the video, where you want to just like let's just be kind to one to one another, let's just be nice people. Like that is kind of my definition of spirituality in a way. Obviously, there are other things, but in the most simple term, I'm like just just be nice and kind towards the others and when when you see as he had mentioned the injustice etc this is what angers you and then that's where you want to make a change and then that making change is basically connected to politics um, that that's kind of how he went he realizes not kind of how it works it's, it in a way of it's just circle now i don't know if you have heard of russell brand he is a famous uh, comedian he used to be married to katie perry and um, I think he has the same, perhaps, dilemma. So he has his political channel, actually, uh, which is not, I would say, like uncensored news. And then he has his spiritual channel. I think he's also deeply spiritual, like he's done transcendental meditation, his practices, etc. So it is a very, very interesting dichotomy. But let's continue. Later on, I evolved into a hardcore atheist. Yeah, because essentially anything that does not fit into my logical scape, I could not digest the, those things. Uh, I'm not somebody who values something because somebody has said it, however important they are. It doesn't matter, it's my parents or uh, uh, God, il God himself spoke or his messenger spoke or whoever spoke. For me, it's of no value unless it makes sense to me. Mm. So nothing made sense to me, people are talking all kinds of things and everybody says somebody said something. So essentially what this means is in their minds, the authority is the tr truth. For me, the truth is the only authority from then to now, it's still the same thing. Nothing changes for me. That is very deep, yes. <laughs> truth is the only authority I have. I don't value any authority. So okay. naturally becoming atheist is natural when you think logically, everything, logically certain things fall into place, rest of the things don't fall into place. So you keep on discounting everything that doesn't fall into logical space. So then I, I traveled crisscrossed India, uh, 
uh, on my motorcycle and uh, I've seen this nation like very few people would have seen. I didn't go to any destination. I just rode across, just the terrain, the people. I slept in the villages, I slept on roadsides, I slept in railway stations, bus stations, you know. I, I just all… the money I had was only for the petrol in my motorcycle and I ate barely. Wow. Cheapest possible food mm -hmm. I ate and I didn't spend one rupee for my sleeping. I always… I slept on my motorcycle most of the time, wow. you know. This is South India or did you travel across? I travelled up to Nepal, this side and this side of Rajasthan. Only Northeast I did not do at that time. Okay. Mostly almost the whole country. What were you seeking? See, I was not seeking anything. Hmm. All I knew was, what I knew, what I perceived was not enough. I knew this is not it, but I don't know what it is. Yeah. See, this is the whole thing people need to understand. They say, I'm seeking God. See, when you say you're a seeker, you become a seeker. Your seeking is genuine only when you don't know. You already know there is God and you're seeking. This is a fake seeking. Mm -hmm. You do not know, that's why you seek, isn't it? When you realize you do not know, you start seeking. So my problem was this, why I look like this, why is this wall blocking my vision? I want to look like this. So I'm doing crazy things with my mind, trying to look beyond. And people, I mean, it'll look uh, absolutely nuts because there are troll armies which will go at me. But there are things you can do with your senses which you have not imagined possible. Such as? You can look, you can look the other side of the wall if you want. There are ways to do it. There are many creatures who are doing that, all right? With the kind of vision that we have, it's not three-dimensional. It not is not, it is only reflection, yeah. all right? But your vision is not just about seeing. You can see things that you have not seen, all right? See, for example, you go into the forest. Uh, the panther there or a tiger there doesn't have to see you. If you're somewhere behind a tree or on top of the tree, Senses. his nose, yes. he sees you. Mm. He knows exactly where you are, mm. all right? He need not physically see you, but he knows exactly where you are. Mm. Most of the time, they're surviving and finding their food only by sense of smell. Mm. So I kind of spend time in the jungles looking as if I just walk into your room, if there are, let's say, five people, with eyes closed if I walk in, I'll tell you there are five people and what kind of people. Yeah. This is not magic, this is just keenness of attention. Hmm. So in all these years of non-stop riding, driving, crazy things, I've never hit anything. People, you know, like I was riding for Kaveri calling these, all these uh, Kannada film stars, they were right. So I want to stop right here because this is very interesting what he's mentioning about like closing your eyes and sensing. So obviously he has developed in himself like a really strong sense strong awareness awareness of energies around him which is really fascinating so i'll tell you something fun when i was a smaller kid um i had like if you would i don't know what it is like in indian school system but we literally uh go to there is a class uh, per year and you have a b c usually like number of classes every class has 30 kids or so and those thir though, that is one class you're going to go for the, let's say, four years or another four years with the same people into. And at the end of the school year, we take pictures like, uh, you know, the, 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 you know, class A of, let's say, 2005. And if someone would give me a photo uh, of those people, what I would do, I would say, uh, this person is like that, this person is like that, this person is like that. And literally, I was right like 95% of the time just by looking at a person through a photo. I think that that is fascinating and it just really brought up this memory with me right now. So, Guru, the way you're writing, what are you thinking about? You just keep going, going, going. What is it? What is it? I said, why am I thinking anything? I don't think anything, I'm just writing. But if there's one rule that you follow when you're writing, what is it? The only rule that I follow, followed is never collide with anything. And still now I'm not. Hmm. Okay, <laughs> not good. That's good. Okay, you still ride? Yes, okay. I, I ride but long distance. You're saying that you were not seeking anything, but were you... No, uh, I'm, I'm not saying I'm not seeking anything. I'm seeking, but I'm saying if you already know what you're seeking... Did you know? No, if you already know, you're not a seeker, I'm saying. So what were you honing? What skills were you honing? Or what were you... What See, was happening then? I felt kind of caged inside the body. I thought this is too limited. Hmm. There must be something beyond. I don't know what that is. I'm, I did not grow up in any spiritual or any kind of culture, traditions, a very agnostic family. There's no for enforcement of religion or anything with us. So only thing is they want us to educate, which I refuse to do. <laughs> so oh, you I, did go to school and college and everything. And you did I get went education. in the direction of the school. Okay. <laughs> not inside. Okay. <laughs> didn't interest you. 
No, I spent time in the libraries, but I never really sat in classrooms much, both in school and college. Okay. Very rarely I went there. So, the important thing is, human beings have assumed too many things. Hmm. You can call it society, you can call it religion, you can call it education. It's all full of assumptions. So essentially, even in school, when you went through school, they rewarded your memory. They never rewarded your attention, isn't it? This is a basic mistake we have done with humanity. We are not rewarding the attention. It's the human attention which opens up doors. Human memory, you call that knowledge, but today artificial intelligence is coming, computers are coming, what the hell will you do with your memory? Right now they're all feeling insecure, what about our jobs? I've been saying this for years, anything that you can grasp as data, analyze and express, a machine can do better than you. I've been saying this for over 20, 25 years. This is so, so true. And um, I don't know if you know the Alibaba owner, he was saying exact, exact same thing, that what happens to us when we, um, when we are, we, we can't compete with a computer as simple as that. So sometimes I feel like uh, I also live in a nation where people really pride themselves on knowledge, but I don't really think that almost that's something to be proud of. I think whatever Sadhguru is saying, he has a lot of a lot of wisdom and knowledge uh, part of that because I think the sense of pride in, in knowing things is an ego thing, actually. But now it's coming becoming a reality. All the academics, others wondering, what will happen to us? You will have no job and it's fantastic. <laughs> the teachers have no job. It's really fantastic, isn't it? Why would you say that? Why, why not? I'm saying, see, well, this, this happened in 70s. I remember this so well. In Mazagaran Docks, they installed the first uh, gantry. Hmm. At that time, a 125,000 ton ship was the largest ship. They would take 24 to 28 days to unload one ship. Hmm. Coolies going up and hmm. bringing things. When they put the first gantry, they said, what are we supposed to do? Our muscles, what are we supposed to do with this? And they went on strike. They closed down the docks for many weeks or so. At that time, you wondered, what are these guys doing? So, now there are gantries in every port. Quarter million ton. Uh, ships lifted, yeah. are emptied within 24 hours, Correct, all right? Yes. So, what are all the schoolies doing? They're obviously doing something else. So, these intellectual coolies also will find something to do. Sadhguruji, you know, in that uh, Joe Rogan show, uh, you spoke about some mystical happenings which happened uh, when you went to Kailash Mansarovar. Uh, what is it that you saw there uh, in, at, you know, that 2.30 a.m. that you saw, which you thought that there was something that happened? Could you tell us what happened at Kailash Mansarovar? See, there is a phenomena that maybe a lot of people are unaware of this. When lightning happens, it's possible 20% of the lightning will be going from earth to sky. Mm. Most of the lightning is coming from there. Up to down, yeah. About 20% could be happening from earth to cloud. That's not what it is. It's not lightning. What's happening there, all I have to admit is, I don't know, really. It's just that you see certain things. This is the most incredible thing about creation, even if you're here for a million years. Still, the damn thing will surprise you and freak you <laughs> because I… people have been telling me about uh, this Kailas and you know, this and that, I'm not a pilgrim kind of person. For me, if, my, if I close my eyes, I'm done, that's my pilgrimage. Okay. But everybody's saying, I thought one time trip we will make to Kailas. Oh my God, what it is, unbelievable. Really? Oh yeah, it is wow. the most incredible thing on the planet. Mm -hmm. So it is essentially, this is a tradition where when people realize something, very difficult to find somebody who will be able to receive that. So, how to store it, the need to store it. If you articulate it in words, it'll be all misunderstood. People will make fantastic stories about it and lose the whole thing. So, one way of storing it is they will find a space, which is hard to approach, but not impossible to approach. When I say this, they would store it in a place like Kailash, but not on Mount Everest. That is nearly impossible to get there but not a place where there's too much of human traffic. A place where it's secluded, where those who really want to go can go. Common people who are now curiosity seekers cannot easily go. Today, of course, we are flying in there and everybody is driving in uh, four-wheel drives and getting there, that's a different matter. But in those days, if you want to go to Kailash, it's a hmm. odorous journey, it's not a simple thing. And there's the China factor? No, there was no China factor at that time okay. because people, there is history of over 12,000 years, Tamil devotees, I've been going to Kailash from southern India for 12,000 years. Imagine a Tamil man, all right? In no, that cold weather. No, no down jackets, no thermal this and that, nothing. Maybe at the most he picked up on woolen rug somewhere. Hmm. And rain and cold and snow and works. 
walking 4,000 kilometers and going and coming back, something should fire them, isn't it? Yeah. This is not for livelihood. It is, there's no gold out there to go in search of that. Is it just a board of Shiva, that's why people went? See, when we call it an abode of Shiva, see, why is somebody valuable to us? After over 15,000 years, why is one man valuable to us? Because of what they offer to us, isn't it? Mm. So many people would have lived in this 15,000 years. We don't care whether they existed or not. Mm. <laughs> we don't know where they were, what they did. But why do you remember one person? Because of the knowledge base. This knowledge base was offered in many ways. Why we built this Adiyogi 112 feet is because of this, because he offered 112 methods as to how a human being can attain to their ultimate nature. When I say ultimate nature, let's put it in modern language. See, today you are who you are. Thirty years ago, did you, had this, did you have the same skills that you have today? No. No, isn't it? So, forty years later, did you have the same skills that you had at thirty? No. No. So, there is something that you evolve. It, I'm not just talking about profession. Mm. I'm saying as a human being, you can hone yourself slowly if you work on it. Some people never do anything. They think once they finish their high school, they're done. Yeah. <laughs> but mm. others hone themselves either with work or with study or with sadhana. One way or the other, people are... Some kind of sadhana they're doing, isn't it? Mm. You may be doing journalistic sadhana, somebody may be doing political sadhana, somebody may be doing spiritual sadhana. Some sadhana they're doing to constantly evolve themselves to the next way of being. Mm. So what would be the ultimate of what you're doing? Now, if you sit there and you know everything that I will say before I say it, this is ultimate journalism, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> My job is to question all the time. No, but I'm saying for every question, mm. if you... I know the answer. If you know what is there, then... Uh, it's death of my career. Uh, this AI is called. <laughs> <laughs> Good one. <laughs> I'll give that to you. <laughs> yes. So you would be GPT. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give that one to you. <laughs> Yeah. So, I'm saying, when we say ultimate, let's not imagine something heavenly, this one, that one, no. Hmm. A human being can rise in... I'm taking you as an example. From the age of twelve to who you are right now, you have risen in many ways. I'm not talking about a social rise. Hmm. That's subjective to times in which we exist. Hmm. But within yourself, hmm. in terms of your experience, in terms of your ability, in terms of knowing life, in terms of grasping what's around you, you have risen in your own way, isn't it? Your sadhana may, may not be like my kind of sadhana, but by working in a certain way, you do some sadhana, all right? Or by studying something, you mm. do sadhana. So every human being, no matter where they are, they are longing to be something more than what they are right now. If that something more happens, will you settle? No, you want to be something more. You would... I, I insulted you with GPT, mm -hmm. but you would like to beat the GPT. That'll yes. be the aspiration, isn't it? Yes. What the GPT cannot do, you want to do. Yes. So essentially, you want to continuously evolve into bigger and bigger possibilities. So if all those things that you can ever dream of, all those things, if I make it happen for you right now, will you settle? No. No. You would want to go further. So essentially, your longing is to evolve or expand in a way that it is limitless. If those who have... those who know only money, they may thinking of limitless money. There's no such thing, but they will try. Somebody who knows only wealth, they'll think limitless wealth. Somebody who has knowledge, limitless knowledge. Somebody who has skills, limitless skills. Somebody who has love, limitless love. Somebody who is in pleasure, limitless pleasure. Everybody is thinking of limitless, may not be addressed as limitless. They are going in installments, but they want limitless. Hmm. If you approach limitless or boundless possibility in installments, it is like counting one, two, three, four, and hoping one day you will say infinity. You can only become endless counting. So when you realize this, you see the problem is not in something else. The problem is in your own faculties, how you see, how you hear, your ability to do... Body is a great possibility, but it's also a cage. Did you feel that uh, people who go to uh, Kailash Mansar over get this realization? Did you feel when you went the first time that you were able to realize your insignificance compared to the magnificence of that place? Very few people can go there and come back without being overwhelmed. Very few. Not because they're bigger than that, because they're insensitive. Otherwise, if you go with a little preparation, how to go there? If somebody is there to tell you how you should approach this, no one will come without being overwhelmed, right? The sheer presence of it is such. Uh, like I'm, as I said, I've grown up as a super skeptic. Mm. I'm skeptical about everything. I don't trust anything around me except what I see and what I perceive. But mm. if you go by your limitations of perception, as I, mean, I was just talking about the wall, it's a limitation. Uh, this is only eight feet away from me, but I can't see beyond that. Why can't I see beyond that? Is there no way to see beyond that? This is because our vision is right now like this, mm. that only if something 
stops light, you can see it. See, right now you can see my hand. But this hand is not so vital for you right now. But the air that you breathe is very vital for you. Without it, you cannot exist. But can you see it? Fortunately, even in Delhi, you can't see it these days. Mm. <laughs> yes, sir. thank God for that. Yes. So you cannot see the air, but it's the most vital thing. You cannot see many things which are the most fundamental aspects of your life. So essentially, spiritual process means making an attempt to see that which does not stop light. That's why it's called enlightenment. So <laughs> for young people who want to seek that enlightenment and get to know themselves. You, you're saying I'm old? <laughs> not at all. <laughs> you are experienced in so many different ways. You give the tools and you teach the tools. But suppose a person cannot get away from their uh, regular life and from their day-to-day -day life. We what can, would you say that? We can teach them where they are. That's why the miracle of online is there. Hmm. So see, uh, we are delivering the inner engineering program, the preparatory part, seven sessions online for quite some time, already hmm. 12, 13 years. But uh, we were always hesitant to do any initiation online because the problem is not doing it online. The problem is the, res the recipient. How will they be? Will they be focused? Will they be there completely or will they misuse hmm. it? Will they harm themselves? This is the issue. How can they harm themselves with it? See, anything powerful, if you don't handle it right, it can harm you. If there is something has the power to transform your life, hmm. you must understand if you don't handle it responsibly, it can also hurt your life. Electricity is fantastic, it's making our lives. You love it and you put your little finger in that hole, you know, it does something else to us. So anything that is powerful enough to transform your life always has the flip side to it if you don't handle it right. That is, this is why the commitment, commitment, we go on pushing for that. But now we found a way that we can proctor thousands of people at a time, 6,000 is the limit we have right now because of some technological reasons, but we are seeing how to make it 25,000. We proctor every one of them in their homes. 25,000 at a time? We could do that. Wow. So, uh, right now we're doing 6,000 at a time. So, volunteers, hundreds of volunteers are sitting the full day and proctoring those people. They have images of uh, all those people on their screens and proctoring them, helping them through, making sure they're focused, making sure they don't do anything wrong. Because How do you have so many volunteers, Sadhguruji? Because there are, I mean, there are skeptics <laughs> who will say that you, you hypnotize or there's some magical element to you. What is it? You don't, as you said, you don't take out gold chains, no vibhuti coming out, nothing of that sort is happening. So how do you get people to do this? See, you need to do a miracle only if you don't realize that life is such a miracle. Right now you're sitting here. You think this is your AI and I studio, this and that, whatever images you have of it. But you are sitting on a tiny little mud ball called planet Earth in the middle of nowhere. Neither the religious people <laughs> nor the men of science know where the cosmos begins and where it ends. In the middle of nothing, spinning and, you know, hurtling through the space, this damn little mud ball, in this you're sitting and so confidently handling everything. I'm not, I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, not I'm saying you're doing you things, are I'm doing things, everybody's doing things, right? I'm saying nobody has a clue where the hell are we going right now? Which part of the galaxy are we in? Where is this planetary system going? Is it going to collapse next moment or will it collapse after a billion years? You don't know, right? You have no clue. But still everything is going fine because we limit our perception and make ourselves a little secure. That security is meaningless to me. I'm always opening up the thing. I'm always almost on a daily basis reminding them, hey, you will die one day, what is it? You know, you're, you're not negotiating death, you're only negotiating the time to die, isn't it? Mm. Hello? That fear of death is something which is which can be weakness and it can be a strength too, right? No. Why is fear a strength? Fear is never a strength. It can motivate you towards positive action. No. I'm fearful of dying tomorrow, so I will work today much more to make my Why day. Why should you work like that? See, this is like in the villages. <laughs> if they want to make a donkey run or something, these are cruel things, which would have been done by village boys. They will, uh, in the Deepavali time and all, they will tie some crackers to the tail of the donkey and the donkey runs faster than a racehorse, mm. out of fear. Is that the way to go in your life? So fear of death makes me do right things. Why? Why the sense of life can't make you do things? So you're asking why so many people are volunteering, doing what they're doing, especially young people. If you come to the yoga center, many of them are with me for over 25, 30 years. They came when they were 18, 20 like this. Today, they're just entering their 40s or 50s in that state they are. Why is it means it's just this, that the seed of life is always being suppressed by the social norms, and education, everything is trying to... Like you're saying, see, you're saying this, not by yourself. You somewhere believe it's only the fear of something which will make you be right. Mm. Fear of death, fear of hell, fear of punishment, right from kindergarten with the stick and cane and whatever nonsense, 
fear of punishment fear of pain fear of suffering is the only way you can be fixed that the whole term god fearing that's what you fear everything and naturally you fear god also mm. all right <laughs> so if you fear everything you are a miserable human being because fear is not a very exuberant wonderful emotion so what would you replace it with celebration joy happiness uh, peace what no it's not like that see life is not a philosophy life is a phenomenon you can either ride it or you can be crushed by it if you are crushed by it you will live in fear and suffering if you learn to ride it so you have seen uh, it's a <laughs> motorcycle metaphor all over again of no, course no. i'd expect you You're, to say you, that no no you uh, see you are being chat gpt now <laughs> <laughs> okay you have seen wave riders mm. are they just riding huge waves what is a wave rider's dream he wants to ride a tsunami all right yeah he could kill him but he wants no it. no he, if he's good at it he wants to ride a tsunami because that's the dream the biggest wave possible you want to ride that because you're good at it if you're not good at it even a tiny little wave will cause fear to you mm. so now i'm not talking about being good at something mm. you're as good a life as anybody else as much a life as anybody else doesn't matter you don't know journalism you don't know motorcycling you don't know wave riding it doesn't matter but if you sit here you're as good a life as anything mm. but that's not how human beings are experiencing this is the only thing i do to people that experientially they realize that they are as good a life as anything can be maybe they're good at nothing in the world it doesn't matter they are as a life they're good enough once people experience this there is a certain exuberance to life you may not know how to do things that other people do when it comes to skills we are not the same people when it comes to intelligence we are not the same people when it comes to language we are not the same people in any act that we perform we are never the two people are never the same isn't it mm. but as far as life is concerned there is no such thing as your life and my life see you're sitting there that's your body this is my body till we are buried all right once we are buried we are all the same soil let's not go there we will right now uh, the about the soil <laughs> i know you're going to get there <laughs> we will we will keep the distinction that's your body this is my body that's your mind this is my mind here and there my mind your mind may overlap and we may be okay but still that is your mind this is my mind sure but there is no such thing as your life and my life it's just like if you and me sit here and blow soap bubbles that's my bubble this is your bubble if it goes poop then you don't say this is my air this is your air this is the nature of life once people experience this there is a certain beauty to your existence because you are not you are not separate from anything it's not like philosophy it is not something that you teach them you not a tool could you give them tools to experience that once they experience that they want that because that's the only thing we have tell me what else you have other than your life rest mm. is all imagination mm. only thing that you have is life isn't it when did you get this realization like uh, most people would think that oh you <laughs> that's what i was about to tell you my problems but you said no 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 please do <laughs> i need to know this <laughs> after all these things then i you know i rode across and uh, they stopped me at nepal border when i went on my motorcycle i was just uh, did you look like this with the beard and no no maybe on riding i won't have shaved for 5 days 10 days but okay. that's about you were not sadguru at this stage no 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 okay even now within myself i am just me okay. people call me sadguru according to their experience so who stopped you at the border uh, the authorities they mm. stopped me and they asked for a passport mm. i was nearly 20 i did not know what is a passport today children will laugh at me i really did not know what's a passport because i have been riding since i am 12 the moment i became 18 i got my driving license i thought this is it <laughs> i'm going everywhere in the world i want to just ride away so uh, they stopped me in this passport i said what is that i didn't know then i came home and looked up what is a passport and first thing is i got my passport <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> because i want to ride away then i realized i need money then i started some businesses one after another everything became successful uh when everything that you're doing is successful you start thinking the world is going around you not around the sun you know true so i am in that state of cocky confidence that everything i do is successful everybody is clapping their hands and uh, everybody says oh is this that this you know in the family mm-hmm. when you're successful at a very young age everybody thinks you're some super nonsense mm-hmm. i'm not uh, talking about money like today they talk in two months they talk of uh, 10 billion dollars 100 billion dollars not that no. kind yeah. but for those days in a small town it is successful right or that kind of success so i am already into half a dozen enterprises all working well and things happening one afternoon i just had a little bit of a break i am working from morning 5 o'clock to 11 o'clock in the night non stop because i have so many things to do mm. and the best part of this work is i need to go from here to there there to there so zipping around on my motorcycle and <laughs> doing all this all kinds of crazy enterprises i did everything worked fortunately 
So this afternoon, I just had about an hour and a half break. In Mysore city, this is the culture that for those days at least, if we want to test our motorcycles, we go up Chamundi Hill. Mm. If you want to party, we go up Chamundi Hill. If we fall in love, we go up Chamundi Hill. <laughs> if we fall out, we have to go to Chamundi Hill. <laughs> okay. If you have nothing to do, we go to Chamundi Hill. So I had nothing to do, unthinking. I didn't think of going there. Simply I rode and I ended up in Chamundi Hill. So I know this hill very well. I've camped there, I've spent days and nights in Chamundi Hill. I know every rock, everything. So there's one of those rocks which is west facing of the Chamundi Hill. I parked my motorcycle, went up and sat. It's around 3.15, 3.30 in the afternoon. Like any other day, I just went and sat. My eyes were still open. After some time, I didn't know what happened. For the first time, till then, I knew, this is me. This is, you know, that's somebody else. I have no problem with somebody else, but this is me, that's somebody. Suddenly, I did not know which is me, which is not me. What was me was just all over the place. I thought this lasted for 10-15 minutes. When I came back to my normal senses, about four and a half hours had passed. Wow. For the first time in my adult life, from the age of eight, I remember, I had not shed a single tear. I'm like this. I'm a close fist, always, never, because I had no such need, emotional needs to cry and do this and that, no matter what happened to me. Here I am, four and a half hours, tears are flowing, my shirt is all wet. And every cell in my body is just wet with ecstasy, it's like that, it's dripping. And I shake my skeptical head and ask, what's happened to me? Only thing that my logic can tell me is maybe I'm going off my rocker. Then I ask my closest friends, you know, something is happening to me. If I close my eyes, I'm just blown away. Like, come on, what did you pop? You found mushrooms in Chamundi Hill? <laughs> what happened? This, that, this is a kind of inquiries. Of course, no, yeah, most people would think that, <laughs> yeah. right? So because I had no context anywhere around me to tell me what's happening to me. Nobody to tell me what's happening to me. All I knew is I've hit a gold mine, I don't want to lose it. That much I know, but I don't know what it is. So I experimented this, what is this? Then I discovered this is so simple. If I can take my hands off my psychological process, my thought and my emotion, if I take my hands off that, every cell in the body just gets blissed out. Like, it's like head to toe. You know, recently, uh, I was twenty-five at that time, about few years ago, maybe four or six years ago probably, one German doctor wanted to do some crazy study on me. And then he said, uh, your cellular age is twenty-five. <laughs> I was surprised, well, how is he saying this? So in a way, it is true because I kind of stopped there. Hmm. I kind of stopped there, I hit the ceiling there, and uh, my cellular age is still twenty-five, I would say. So, you were… you feel physically you stopped aging in that process? What… was it a miracle, uh, Sadhguruji? See, this is what… this is why I'm saying… It's a logical question no, I would ask. No, I'm, asking, I'm not asking what you I'm bought. I'm asking, see, this rose flower became so beautiful and fragrant, not because somebody put perfume at the roots, they put filth, all right? Hmm. So, no. See, the filth became so beautiful hmm. and fragrant. Is this magic? Magic of nature, I would think. You no. call it whatever. Is it magic? No, it's not. It's not applied magic. It's a process magic. Process. What did you have for lunch? Soup. Soup? Whatever soup it is, I won't question. Dal. All right. You eat dal soup. Same as a South Indian person eating dal soup, but... Mulagatani. <laughs> 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 anyway, you drink soup and it becomes a woman like you. Hmm. Is this magic? No. Why is it not? It's not something that if was you, done. See, it is done. You eat a chapati and you become a wonderful woman. Is it magic? No. Why is it not? Uh, magic would be something that would that would be out of the ordinary, I would feel. Is it? Is it ordinary? If I take a chapati in my hand and make a human being out of it, is that magic? Yes. But if you do it in your stomach, it's not magic. No, because that's the biological process, no? See, that is an explanation. But is it not magical? Uh, yeah, magic of nature, as I said before. That... That's you're, how... you're dismissive when you say magic of nature. Hmm. You don't have to eat human flesh to become a human being. You can eat dal, you can eat chapati, you can eat whatever nonsense you want hmm. and still become a human being, isn't it? In hmm. a matter of few hours. Hmm. Is that not magical? Tell me one thing that's not magical in the existence. Yeah, I get that. But many people go to yogis and uh, godmen waiting for that magic. Yes, I'll come to it. That is because they have not seen the magic of life. They don't have the attention hmm. to see the magic of life. If you pay attention, there is nothing here which is not magical. So anyway, let me tell you about that day. And six, uh, six to eight weeks passed and I realized this is all it is. If I can keep my hands off my psychological process, I will burst into blissfulness. Then I thought, who wouldn't want it? Yeah. Who wouldn't want to simply be blissed out? Because there is enough scientific evidence today to show when your experience of life is very pleasant, your intelligence, 
your physiology, everything that you have works at its best. There's no question about that. There's no question about that anymore because it's all established today in the lab. Because everything has to come from the lab today. It's come from the lab, well established. We ourselves have a, a research center in the Harvard Medical School in the Beth Israel Hospital where it is a Sadhguru Center for Conscious Planet, whatever we're doing that. Top scientists are working. And uh, they're all saying the same things we've always been saying from our experience. Now they're speaking a little different language, complicated language about simple things. Hmm. <laughs> so once I realized this, I sat down, I was 25, and I sat down and planned. At that time, the world's population was 5.6 billion people. I said, in two and a half years, I sat down and made a detailed plan. In two and a half years, I will make the whole world blissful. Hmm. Here I am, 40 years, this year is 40 years, hmm. okay? 1982, this is... 2023, all right? <laughs> 40 years it is. Well, people say we've touched over two billion people, whatever, but that's not my idea of humanity. So I'm telling you my problems, I will die as a failure, I know that, but I'm a blissful failure. <laughs> you're a blissful failure. I wonder what that makes the rest of us, if that's what you're saying. Uh, Sadhguruji, um, I will come back to that question which I asked you that, you know, most people think, like, in fact, Yogi Adityanath is also criticized for this reason that you are yogi, you are Himalaya. Mein ja ke rahi hai. Why are you doing, why are you getting involved with politics and all? You should be See, the disconnected things, from... The highest things about yoga was, in a way, in recent times. When I say recent times, in India, recent means five, six thousand years. In recent times, was by Krishna. He's the ultimate politician and kingmaker, all right? So, this idea, a yogi means must sit in a cave and if he comes out, his yoga will fall off. That is not a very good yoga. People ask me, oh, why are you dressed like this? Why do you drive this? Why do you fly a helicopter? Why do you do this? Why do you do that? Hey, I can do anything. My spirituality is not so fragile that I have to protect myself in a cave. I can be anywhere. I can live in a marketplace and still remain the same. Doesn't matter what kind of company I am in. Uh, you know, I'm part of the New York uh, fashion uh, week. Yes. Yes. I know. So, That's why I was asking. I'm saying the texture of my clothing will not take away my spirituality. I am not that fragile. You were at the Nita Ambani uh, uh, the cultural, center, cultural, cultural center. center. Yes. Uh, there too, we saw you walk the red carpet. I think Sadhguruji and in no, fashion... they put a carpet with red. What can I do? <laughs> okay. If it blue also, I would walk. If it but black like also, I would walk. golfing and, you know, so naturally... Some Today, I inaugurated the G20 golf tournament. Yeah. Let me tell you this. Sports is See, important for you, right? See, if you don't know how to play, hmm. play means this. Play cannot see, you can worship without involvement. You can get married without involvement. You can bear children without involvement. But you can't hit a ball without involvement. Hmm. A ball won't listen to your nonsense. Whatever you fool yourself with, hmm. game is such that you cannot play without absolute involvement. I think, I'm paraphrasing, uh, I may not be getting the right words. I think it's Swami Vivekananda who said this, that you are closer to the divine in kicking a ball than in your prayer. Something like this. In, to that extent, that, to that uh, meaning, he said something in those terms. Because it's true. Yeah. You can do, you can learn the mantra and go on saying it, thinking about hundred other things. Mm. But you can't, if you think about hundred other things, a ball won't go where you want it to go. Mm. That's a good thing about a ball. <laughs> yeah. Where so, you hit in the concentration. Yes. It, you, without involvement, mm. without involvement, it will mm. not happen. This is the fundamental. Without involvement, you will go without knowing nothing about life. Uh, so this is interesting and I'll stop right here because what he's actually describing is basically when you're involved in an activity like that you're in a state of flow there is this psychologist that studied the flow I I cannot pronounce his name something with Chen 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 um, I will try to uh, a link it uh, in, in the kind of like I'll put a banner uh, so you can check this out and this is kind of when you are in flow this is when you are the most connected to the divine so I love that that he's mentioned that Sadhguruji when you went to these places like the fashion place and you went to the Ambani center you play golf with people some people think that you know that you're close to very powerful people <laughs> that very uh, successful, rich people are around you and that's how it you become a magnet for successful people. Is that no. true? See, why would I come to Delhi and go to the slums in Delhi? 70% mm. of our work is in rural India. Rural India is a slum, I want you to know. 70% of the work is in rural India. People who come to me, over 70 to 80% are all rural people. 
when I come to Delhi, of course I want to meet people who matter, who are either in positions of responsibility or something, otherwise, how do you do work? So their problem is, their attention is only on them. See, they, people, I'm, I'm not uh, trying to be uh, commenting on any particular profession, but journalists particularly, they come to the yoga center. One film star or one minister, somebody is there. Their focus is only that. There are other 30,000, 40,000 other people. Your cameras never caught them. You never paid attention. The problem is with you, but you think I have a problem. Mm. I have no problem with the celebrity. I work with, uh, I work in the prisons. I work uh, with rural people. I work with tribal women. I work with anybody because my work is with human beings. What the hell they think of themselves is not my business. My business is human beings, mm. whoever they are. Whom do you connect with easier? Uh, rural folk or complicated city folk, rich folk? Who, even... who has more more existential problems in your and not just that uh, is it Indian American because you spend a lot of time in America what about that like in the west coast do you feel that they take like I know one answer you gave said they go round and round and round to come to telling what their problem is whereas in India Patak say they tell like that what their issue is so where, whom do you connect with more I even connect with the grasshopper as I connect with the the, loud, the most loud one in my life hmm. it's, it's not any different for me because see this is this is the whole thing we are misunderstanding the involvement of life to relationships. See, now if I spend ten days in your home and talk to you, we may develop a relationship bond. Right. But when you sit here in front of me, not because of who you are, because you're sitting in front of me, if you ask me who is the most important per person in your life, I'll say it's you. Yeah. This is, this is not because of anything, because this is how my attention is, this is how my involvement is, this moment, Whatever is there, whether it's a flower or a grasshopper or a human being, my involvement is absolute. About the question is, this question of, if you are a yogi, you must be in a certain way. Why are you doing all these things? Let me tell you, because Buddha Purnami is coming. Let me honor him with for this. When Gautama was traveling, during the monsoon times, they would stay. Along with him, there are hundreds of monks. Everybody needs to be accommodated somewhere. Everybody goes and stays in different homes. Even now, we, try, we do like this. Our full-time volunteers are all supported by part-time volunteers. Mm. Eight, ten volunteers take care of full-time volunteer, their clothing, their travel, their food, everything is taken care of. That's how we, we do work. So they were also doing that uh, a few thousand years ago, but they were doing the same thing. How else to do work? So monsoon time, they can't be traveling because they're traveling by foot. They stayed in one town. So one lady came to Gautama. She's a local courtesan, or to put it simply, she's a prostitute. Mm. And uh, she comes and says, I heard that your monks are looking for residences. Why don't you send some monks to me? And uh, everybody had gone, one or two were left, Ananda Tirtha was left. And she looked at, why doesn't he come? He's a tall, handsome monk. Mm. She said, why doesn't he come and stay with me? Gautama said, by all means, Ananda can stay with you. So he told Ananda, please go stay with the lady. So she went to the prostitute's house. Oh, the whole town went agog. Oh my God, he sent a monk to a prostitute's house. What's happened? So when he went there, the lady brought nice silk clothing and said, well, you're wearing very rough clothing, let me wash it, you wear this. So he wore silk robes and he sat there, she played music, she danced for him. He paid absolute attention and watched her. People said, see, she's singing music, then what'll happen next, what'll happen, then imagine everything. Then after the monsoon was over, after a few weeks, the Ananda Tirtha came back to Gautama along with a nun. She turned into a nun. Mm. So when people were questioning him, he said this, he said, see, I'm walking this path because I see this as the most powerful way to live. But you're telling me her ways are more powerful than mine. If it is so, I will also join her. I'm like that. If I find something more powerful than the way I'm existing right now, I will join that. What is your existence right now? So I'll stop there because there's a very interesting thing that he uh, is uh, actually calling out and she's asking that... Uh, like a spiritual person that needs to be considered one one way or the other who he's associated with. And I completely agree with him. It's it's kind of not about that. He's just rejoicing in his existence with whoever is around him. And also, you know, if 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 we are all one and we are all connected, so why do we judge one another? Why do why do we have to let's say in a way behave a certain way? Um, you know, I, I, I believe that the universe wants us to be abundant and super happy. And if you judge 
someone else just because they're rich or or whatever obviously you're entitled to your opinion it's like you're inherently judging yourself and i don't think personally that's the best way how to how to show up in the world but obviously we we are all different but it's also it, it's it's interesting to explore the psychology behind that because you see that we judge people through how we grew up, what are the pre- what are our parents, what are the what are the beliefs, what kind of part of the world we believe that, and we then judge. For example, you wouldn't even judge me through your lens of your background and where, where you're from and your beliefs, and you impose it on the person. However, the person is nothing like what you think they are because they are their own unique self defined by their own unique beliefs. I I, I really kind of uh, like that aspect as well so let's continue you lead very busy lives you're constantly <laughs> traveling uh, and you want to you want to touch people's lives and bring that blissfulness that you experienced into as many lives Just as possible to rub off my experience on people that's all <laughs> what, but what is that secret sauce that attracts millions to uh, isha foundation what is that you feel in you see look i'm sure you must be thinking what do i do what is it that i do which the other people don't do don't you think that <laughs> I do life they do mental circus I do life <laughs> I've got my headline <laughs> <laughs> I just do life nothing else <laughs> So you don't think that there's anything which is mystical and magical that you do I mean of course you have an issue with the whole term magical No no, no I'm I have no issue with that I'm only saying See one thing see magic means what now if I put my hand into my pocket and pull out a pigeon this is magic Yeah that's it? what people ah, would think mostly yes. right But if I pull I out a pigeon, I was coming back to that vibhuti and yes. chains. If I pull out a pigeon and give it to you, you have a bird and I have a shitty pocket. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's all it is. <laughs> What do you do with that magic? Now I can show you a different magic. If you come to the yoga center, I'll show you people who've been there for many years. In the last ten years, hmm. they've not had a moment of angst, moment of anger, moment of frustration, moment of anything. They're simply there, not simply sitting somewhere in a cave, actively working with all sorts of people, hmm. and still don't experience that. this is the magic that the world needs and that's the magic i'm trying to weave sakuru ji when you're attached to family when you're attached to your children your aging parents your your spouse who might why, why only those five six people why not to me uh, yes but you're born into those uh, relationships right to get no, into no, a your relationship no no your husband was not born with you your children were not born society with you society gave that yes correct so when you're when you no no i'm asking okay why are you attached only to five things why are you not attached to the whole universe what's stopping you but that would mean disconnecting with those right no why 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 is that it's not so see right now I as i said earlier now i'm looking at you you are the most important life in my life right now if i think no no my daughter is more important than you my friend is more important than you why mm. right now you are the most important person because you're here with mm. me because this is life now i'm thinking of my daughter this is my psychological memory right mm. when she is there she is there that's a different matter so you are giving more significance to your memory than your experience lots of people say that one meal a day everybody wants to know from you of course that how you're so fit and uh, is it one meal a day which everybody the the mythology around you the myths around you is that one meal a day he eats only nuts no. he's very careful <laughs> diets not a lot not i eat whatever i feel like eating i am not careful about diet i am not careful about anything i am hmm. somebody who lives like i could die today always hmm. so i am not by rule one one meal a day but generally i find for the type of work that i do if i'm it's a busy day at the yoga center means i don't feel like eating in the morning so i eat somewhere between 4 to 6 in the evening i eat a full when i sit down at the table i don't like to measure and eat i eat what i like to eat proper south indian meal properly i eat so once Which i eat rice and sambar mostly 5 days 6 days in a week at least 5 days in a week we eat millets two days we eat rice or chapati or something but and vegetables yes organically grown i'm guessing uh it's from the local marketplace semi organic mm, okay. <laughs> we are not growing anything because we wanted to support the farmers around us okay. so we contract them rather than we growing it ourselves mm. uh recently you know um the delhi chief minister made this comment uh when he said uh that you know the prime minister's people tell me that he sleeps only 3 hours in a day and that's why he's so grumpy all the time <laughs> because he sleeps so less he needs to sleep a little more so uh, what is <laughs> so what is uh what is yoga tell us how much uh, is there a route that you need to sleep this much so we must understand sleep means it's the down time for the body it's the maintenance time suppose uh, you have a car 
which needs one day of maintenance in thirty days, it's all right. But suppose it needs ten days of maintenance in thirty days, better get onto the bus, isn't it? So right now, uh, doctors have been saying, others have been saying, you must leave for eight hours a day, otherwise your heart will, this will go happen, that will happen. Yeah. Hours a day means you're sleeping away one third of your life, twenty-four hours. Eight hours you're sleeping, one third. Another two hours could be going in other kind of maintenance of eating, bathroom, this, that, whatever. Because all these things are needed, bodily processes are a must, we can't be without it. So if eight to tel twelve hours are going in maintenance, when are you going to live really? It's not efficient way of living. So don't fix times like that. See how to make body more efficient, more energetic, more effervescent. Naturally, the need for food, see right now, uh, there was an ambassador, because I'm not making a comment about any brand, but because that brand doesn't exist, I think we can talk I about it. I like how you go into automobile <laughs> metaphors all the time. Uh, because fuel, we're talking mm. about fuel. Mm. You were driving an ambassador car, if you put one liter, if it ran for three to four kilometers, it was great. Mm. If you press the throttle in two kilometers, one liter got ran away, because half of it would be leaking out also, so many things. Today you have more efficient cars, bigger cars, faster cars, which will run ten, twelve kilometers for the same liter. Some of them run over thirty kilometers for the same liter. The hybrid ones running forty-five kilometers for the same liter. What is this? Upgradation of technology and better maintenance. When I say better maintenance, less friction in the whole machinery. So you, you may think this is me, but actually this is a bi biological machine, isn't it? If you take away all the friction within, both food and sleep, the need will come down. It consumes less fuel, it needs less downtime. This is something you must do if you're interested in living. Because if you're sleeping, people say, I enjoy sleep. Nobody can enjoy sleep because you're not there. You enjoy the restfulness. Why are you not restful when you're sitting here? You're simply revving at a high RPM for no reason. And then you want to lie down and sleep because the body is tired. Tired, yeah. So it is not something that you prescribe. You work towards making the body very effervescent and alive. Mm. What kind of fuel would do that? How much fuel would do that? Then naturally sleep arranges itself. I never fix how much I'm asleep. I've never woken up to uh, an alarm. My my girl just laughs at me. You don't know how to set an alarm on the phone? I said, I don't need it. Do you have a phone? Yes, I have a phone. What do you do mostly with the phone? It's Make my, calls? It's or... my office. It's your office. I don't go to any office. I handle everything on the phone today. You're such a social media sensation on YouTube, on Facebook, on Instagram. Do you check? Your, what do people see? What do people ask? What do people comment about you? I may not be able to see comments much. Hmm. Uh, here and there maybe, just to have a feel of it. Like, but every why do they like my sambar? <laughs> <laughs> That's what I said, there is a certain fascination about food probably because uh, good home food is disappearing so fast yeah. that people think it's something exotic that somebody can make sambar just in a mm -hmm. camper. I'm making sambar in a camper that I'm driving during the virus time. Yeah, did you do that? I wanted to ask you, when you traveled for Save the Soil, when you, you went on your motorbike across the world, uh, what was it about, you know, food that you did? Uh, American food, uh, you know, you went to Egypt and you went to all those places, drive, <laughs> riding in the uh, desert and all that. What did you do for food? There was a team organizing food ahead of time for the whole, because there was nearly a team of uh, 27 to 30 people, hmm. uh, photographers, videographers, hmm. and setting up. See, because we were not just riding. In these hundred days, I said 691 events. Yeah, that's so, phenomenal. Yeah, those events, organizing those events, there were people traveling with me or ahead of me most of the time. So they would have food ready at a certain place. It didn't always come on time, but I'm okay with food. I'm not. Uh, I'm not like, like I must fine. eat at a given time. I'm okay. food and sleep never came to me. What about controversies? Do they bother you? Uh, see, the thing is, <laughs> I made myself like this that somebody else will never determine how I am. Mm -hmm. Somebody else or something else never determines how I am within myself. So if it if the controversy supports the work, I don't mind the controversy. If it's impeding the work, of course, we would like to relieve that. <laughs> like for Isha Foundation comes under criticism many times that you've taken... Always. Land. What do you mean many times? Okay. Always. <laughs> Always. And then those who, uh, those who do not succeed in bringing you down legally, they say that the reason is because Sadhguruji is connected so well with powers that be. <laughs> That's why. With powers that be, you can inquire. You're a journalist. Have I ever gone to any chief minister or prime minister ever asking something for myself? Ever. Have I taken one rupee from any government? Have I taken an inch of land from any government? No. If I go to meet them, I go there only to contribute to what they are doing. If I have an idea, if I think a certain law should happen to facilitate something, only that. I've never gone to any politician, any powers that be, including God, asking for something. I've never prayed in my life, 
ever you've never prayed no <laughs> really but doesn't don't you feel hurt uh, dejected at times uh, why no that's why i said nobody else decides what happens within me does sadguru need a guru ever i had when i needed very long time ago hmm. and uh, that's a different dimension altogether people are right now there are troll armies which doesn't like the word dimension so whenever i say dimension i say dimension 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 for their benefit <laughs> so okay. i'm saying whatever negativities people do the problem with them is they want to make a living so they know that if they use somebody's name they can make a living they are doing that i'm okay if they make a living but if they impede the work then of course we act to see how to relieve those things but till now whatever they have said have they produced one iota of proof one one little thing no this is not exaggeration of what we are doing this is just total imagination of what it is so any number of times openly i have challenged you are talking about thousands of acres of forest i said one inch forest land tribal land private land government land one inch anywhere if there's an encroachment i'll leave the country i'll withdraw from all the social media thing you will never hear of me again i'm done if one inch if you show me i invite them please come stay at our expense go ahead and find out they won't come why because they make a living like this is very unfortunate way to live but unfortunately they are making a living like that right uh satguruji a person like me or any of my colleagues they'll come to you and ask you questions like how should i be happy how should i get rid of tensions how can i sleep what should i eat these are the kind of questions that most of us would come up with when rich people come to you what do they say when can i make my first billion second billion what do powerful people say when can i become prime minister do they come and ask you these kind of questions <laughs> uh not exactly see you are thinking see lot of people think you are very rich and powerful somebody who has nothing looking at you they're thinking that you are very rich and powerful so who is rich and powerful to you may not be rich and powerful to somebody else so for me nobody is rich and powerful if they have a problem how are they powerful ah <laughs> <laughs> i don't have any problem so you can say i'm powerful not power over somebody i have complete power over my life and that's all that matters i have no power over anybody else but this is all that people want that they want to be power over their own life they don't understand that and they think by conquering something the procuring something acquiring something it will happen let me tell you this just before i started uh, save soil uh, movement i was in the united states that's when this rogan thing and all happened mm. i was campaigning for the uh, trevor noah also yes, yes and a few others some of them did negative hit jobs on me mm. it's okay uh so at that time i was meeting people and one day i see one young man behaving like his tail is on fire mm. i said hey what are you up to <laughs> he said sadguru i want to make 1 billion dollars 1 billion dollars oh that's all you come tomorrow morning i'll give you a billion dollars really you will give me a billion dollars i said yes tomorrow you come i'll give you a billion dollars he had come with eight of his friends mm. they were all sitting quietly i said see these eight guys who are sitting quietly i'll give each one of them 10 billion dollars Oh Sadhguru why Sadhguru you giving them 10 only one for me I said you idiot just now you wanted only one <laughs> <laughs> the moment they get 10 you are miserable about the one so unfortunately people have made themselves like this they only enjoy what others don't have this is the fundamental mistake about life you don't enjoy what you have you enjoy what others don't have this is a sickness you think it's joy it is not joy joy is a natural exuberance of life so whether you are a politician or a convict or a journalist or a man woman whatever the hell you are you think you are all that but essentially you are a life either constipated or blossoming <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> do people think that when they come to you for advice do many people think that you can see the future people try these days they have given up because i know uh, they know by now that if i if they ask such questions where i will take them they become gtps you know <laughs> <laughs> they predicting what i may say so the important thing the important thing about my life is not about predicting your future about empowering you to create your future mm. this is the most important aspect of this culture why this anatan dharma is important is here we have no sense of god there is no the god in this country we are a godless nation we know the technology of god making but we don't have the god all the people that you worship are people who walk the geography of this land Shiva walked this land. Yadav Yogi walked this land. Krishna walked this land. Rama walked this land. They had all the troubles, are more trouble than you ever face in your life. But they're gods, no? No, no. We'll come to that. You can call them whatever you want. Essentially, 
they walked in human form on right. this land. Mm. Yes or no? Yes. Were their lives just magical or full of trouble? Well, look, okay. look at Rama's life. Yeah. It's a, it's a serial, serial disaster. See, suppose you are a queen of a kingdom. At the age of 19, you're coronated. And then they take away your kingdom and send you to the forest. One disaster like that, you wouldn't recover. Most people. Yeah, tribulations all his life. Most people wouldn't re recover with one disaster. Yeah. Lost his kingdom, as if that's not good enough. Lost his wife. Then he goes out and battles and kills people that he doesn't want to kill. And then gets back his wife and again some politics and sends away his pregnant wife to the forest. Never gets to see his children. Unknowingly, he almost killed his children. See, if you or me or anybody, knowingly or unknowingly, we killed our own children. In Biggest many grief. ways, that yeah. is the worst thing that you could do. Correct. He almost did it. Yeah. And then he never got to see his wife. She died in the forest. So this is not a successful life. But the important thing why we worship him is, no matter what happened, he remained the same, no angst, no hatred, no nothing. He even did penance for killing Ravana. Hmm. Okay, because this is what, this is the only thing that we value in this culture, is freedom, liberation, mukti. When you're alive, if you're free from everything, you're not withdrawn, you're active, but, but free. That is only one avatar of Vishnu, no, where this happened. In the others, uh, in the other avatars, it, was, it wasn't that, it wasn't... Uh... See, what you call as avatar is Darwin's theory of evolution. This was not spoken recently. This was spoken, they say... Hello, Adi... welcome trolls, for what Sadhguru Adi Yogi, Adi Yogi himself is supposed yeah. to have spoken this. Correct, yes. The first life, see, what are the avatars tell me? Matsya, Matsya Paraha. No, no, don't go there, one at a time. Matsya avatar, what does it mean? Fish. Water life, yeah. life, waterborne life. There was a time when hardly 10% or 5% of the land was land, rest was all water. So first life was naturally waterborne. What is next? Kurma. Okay. So what does it mean? Amphibious life. Huh. Crawled out of the water, half on land, half on this, learning to live on land. That's what amphibious life means. Next is, among the many creatures, smaller creatures, they're ignoring and coming to mammals. The first mammal or the grossest mammal is a pig or a wild boar. Why I'm saying it's grossest is even today. At least the ladies will say this, if a man is very crude, you'll say it's like pig. a pig. Mm. Yes. <laughs> so, something very basic means pig. So, the most basic mammal is a pig, very rooted in its body, very hard to kill a pig. People don't understand this. It's not like killing a deer or a goat or something. Very hard to kill a pig. It takes a lot to kill the pigs mm. because they're so rooted in their physicality. If somebody is very physical, you say he's like a pig. Mm. So, the next thing is what? Narasimha. Narasimha, half man, half animal. Half man, half animal. Mm. Next thing is what? Vamana, dwarfed man. Next thing is what? Parashurama, Parashur. full-fledged man but volatile. Yeah. volatile. Next is what? Rama, peaceful man. Next is Krishna. what? Krishna, a loving man. Next is supposed to be a Buddha, a meditative man. The next one Kaiki. is supposed to be a mystical man. Don't look at them as individual people. These are different stages of evolution. Just look at Darwin's theory of evolution. It is parallel to this in many ways. He might have gone at it with a different context. So Sanatan Dharma has an explanation or a... A Sanatan view of life has, has explanations for life? Ev evolution. evolution. We're talking about evolution. See, there are places in our Vedas where they're talking about single-celled animals, okay? We're talking about evolution because we are a dialectical culture. We don't do anything in a way that it doesn't touch your life. We write our history that way, we science, write our science that way. Because if it's not going to touch and transform your life, mm -hmm. what is the point of any science or history? So this also is said in such a way that we are making it an embodiment of that stage of development and saying it is this person, this person. It is not about people. It is about different uh, levels of evolution that happened. So next one is supposed to be mystical. Right now, even your technology is becoming almost mystical, isn't it? Hmm. Right now, Unable to understand. No, I'm everything? saying, if a machine gets up and suppose you are a robo, I don't know. It could be. Or I could be. Why you? If somebody builds a machine just like me and talks like me, chat GTP is answering all your questions and you mm. don't know, I finished the podcast and went home mm. and you don't know, it can easily be done. Yeah. We're not very close to that. See, almost 20 years ago, Mr. Honda, the Japanese, uh, the Honda company chairperson said, by 2050, we will produce 11 member football team and they will win the World Cup. And they're not far from that. Mm. They can win the World Cup because you can make every player uh, a Lionel Messi or the best in, the, in those different spots of the game. So, is this not mystical? It's manifesting also in a way, isn't it? It's, it's mystical. We're getting there. Okay. See, we are always trying to separate this and that. Life is not in separation. Life is in unity, always. Sadhguruji, uh, you know, the current Prime Minister has given this thing that India is on the way to becoming a Vishwaguru. 
there are many people who are skeptical about these kind of things <laughs> that this is too much we can't sol- resolve our own problem of giving water to every home ho- uh, you know public toilets we can't these basic things we can't do so what is this vishwaguru thing is he, is he also doing this kind of thing that which you said about mr honda which is you know manifested that once you have a goal you achieve that do you think that there's a similarity see ya uh, how india was viewed just 20 years ago and how it is viewed by the world today the people who are skeptical should go out in the world and see how indian means nobody even paid attention to you today indians are, wow you're from india they say mm-hmm. 70 70 fortune 500 companies have indian ceos most of the ivy league universities have indian uh, you know uh, deans and things like that it's not small because we took a historical beating in terms of innovations we lost so many things the continuity of our culture was lost the continuity of knowledge was lost everything was destroyed today there slowly certain you know unprejudiced historians and scientists are looking at it and saying almost everything that you call as science that came from europe the fundamentals came from india the mathematics came from india all right even uh, the most uh, simple thing that everybody study what is this uh, this theorems that you study in high school mm. they all were here well before the europeans did that they traveled here they took it they dropped our this thing and uh, produced it in their own languages and said we found it but our problem has always been this we never put ourselves out well our our problem is we don't have a packaging industry we have products yeah. we don't have packaging but now we are learning to package it well but at the same time just 250 years ago we were 30% of the world's export that means we must be packaging it well also hmm. it's been destroyed systematically destroyed all right it's not just didn't get destroyed ad hoc systematically destroyed by somebody who had a different intent fine it's happened it's there's no point being bitter about it because bitterness will not kill them it will only kill us sure. all right so today it's on an upsurge it is a land of so many complexities that's our strength that's our problem do we have the brains and the patience to handle the complexity and take it somewhere or will we get tangled up in our own complexity this is a important thing for this you need a leadership which is visionary which has the necessary courage which has the necessary ruthlessness to push in one direction no matter who says what this is needed in this country otherwise this country will not get out of its pits mm. we are a plethora of problems but we are a tremendous possibility today everybody is looking at the possibility of india those who are here commenting about local they're just involved in this local news mess that's going on they don't understand how the world is looking at us right now the world is looking at us one of the greatest possibilities on the planet and we will be i have no doubt about that it is just that if we do this in a planned way in a determined way in a strategically because one important thing indians have been lacking is that we have always been accused of not having strategic thinking for the first time we are showing some sense of strategic thinking we are a nation we are a culture we are a civilization who strategized thousand years later what we will be doing at one time but albert einstein when he came to india whatever uh, and uh, you know i've always been telling people he met the wrong indians <laughs> he met some people whoever he met i don't know who he met he said indians can't think 15 million minutes beyond where they are no i said i keep telling people he met the wrong indians he didn't meet us <laughs> all right so we have to change that we need to bring strategic thinking we need to go where we want to go not wherever winds push us right we need to go where we want to go i think that determination the younger generation is beginning to show the aspirations are such they want to go where they want to go this is not going to happen just like a dream there is striving there is a whole lot of striving to make this happen only question is will you do it joyfully or miserably that's your choice wonderful and anybody who says that if you you need somebody needs to sleep more uh that's a political ambition i think so just the, there it, it is very interesting i would i would be curious to hear why is he saying that indians are lacking strategic thinking i'd love to know in the comments uh, below like where he's actually coming from and it was interesting to, to say that he mentioned you guys have products but you don't know how to package and i think it almost feels like um coming from a nation that has been uh obviously uh virtually almost destroyed by by the invasions and the colonial rule and i think that that's kind of what happens also i see correlation between this and slovakia because i feel like the the confidence of people is just so pushed down and they uh, and there is this strong need to to feel validated and just 
maybe even act small. Um, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's exactly the same in Slovakia where there are so many smart people, but you know, as in like you have products, but you don't know how to sell it. And I think that maybe, at least this is what I think, I might be completely wrong. It's just my assumption when I'm just observing things. It's just that um, it, it comes with a sense of pride and, and, and self kind of respect and self worth. And uh, obviously America has done it brilliantly, right? Like they're the best people that can sell anything to almost anyone. They've successfully exported their culture. But I feel like when you've been suppressed as a nation for, for centuries, it, it really uh, reflects then on your self-worth. And then you feel like not, not good enough, etc. You may not talk about yourself as like, I'm the best thing since slice bread type of, type of conversation. But I think that just a generational national process that some countries master, some countries need to uh, develop. Um, but it, this is a very interesting talk. Finally, uh, Sadhguruji, we talked about where we are going, how we are heading. 2023, where is Sadhguruji going? Uh, are you going to be in India? You travel so much. So where do you see home? You're such a global person. Do you see home as in India? And are you traveling this year? It goes with me wherever I go. <laughs> mm. Sometimes I like the food, sometimes I don't like. But it's like home. Some, sometimes food turns out well, sometimes it doesn't. <laughs> are you... Do you have... A, like, like you had Save the Soil, is there something that you're planning uh, the next project? Yes, uh, we are in the process of crafting what is called as Conscious Planet Movement. It's a global movement. Even Safe Soil Movement did not happen under Isha Foundation. It happened under Conscious Planet, which is a separate foundation outside of the Isha Foundation. What Conscious Planet means is, see right now, there are many aspects. If you... I mean, I don't want to go into detail considering the time. There is only one problem on the planet, the human being. Hmm. If you and me are not here, what's the problem on this planet? There's no problem on this planet. Everything is fine, isn't it? Right now, everything is a problem. Every natural color, natural process, natural uh, happening that happens, we call it a calamity. When earthquake happens, we die. If a flood comes, we die. If anything happens, if a spectacular volcano blows, we will die. Everything is a calamity in our understanding. These are all natural happenings which have always been happening for millions of years. So this has become like this because of the way we have constructed our own lives in a compulsive manner. Our own intelligence has become the most serious problem. Right now, people are talking about mental health pandemic. I know this will get me heavy trolls, but I must say this to them. If you do not understand your physical and mental health is your responsibility, the chances of you being physically, mentally healthy becomes more and, rem more, and more remote as time passes because of a variety of reasons. Soil is very directly connected to your mental health mm. and physical health, of course. Mental health, I am saying, because that's the most fragile part of who you are, and that will go off first. Physically, you're feeling this and that, somehow you carry on, you don't think you're ill. Something is simple for most people, all their faculties are not fully functional, <laughs> all mm. right? But they carry on thinking, this is how it is. But the moment the mental fac faculties don't work, you, cl you get clearly crippled. Mm. So that is beginning to happen. The recent CDC stats say in America, one in every three teenage girls are depressed. When we are growing up, a teenage girl means she will giggle for nothing. Mm. There's no way to get her depressed. Joy was there. Simply yes. exuberant because that's the nature of life, when it's blossoming in a certain yeah. way. Even a little donkey, you see, when it's at a certain age, it simply jumps around for joy of life, not for anything that happened to it, simply for the joy of life. Look at a puppy, how it jumps around. The same with human beings also. So adolescence is a time when your physicality and everything is blossoming, people are just giggly and bubbly. But today they're depressed, one in three. This is dangerous. This is a dangerous proportion. One in three is depressed means one third of the population. Mm. You, you don't have enough psychiatrists to deal with no, that kind of stuff. No. There is no way you can do it. You don't have that much furniture, first of all. Mm -hmm. <laughs> true, true. So, exactly. what is it? See, if you can conduct your thought process consciously, would you ever go mentally off? No. If you can conduct your emotions consciously, would you go ever go off? No. no. So what is missing is consciousness. But what we're looking at is, is like this. Suppose this room is dark and I say, Smita, get this damn darkness out. And you start pushing it, kicking it, whatever. Will it go? Turn on the light and it's gone. Yeah. So for compulsive behavior within ourselves, the only and only solution is consciousness. So this conscious planet movement, we're trying to build technology platforms to proctor people that our aim is two to three billion people. 
should have a minimum of 12 to 15 minutes of practice that they will do and we will monitor them for at least one year minimum that they're actually doing it. We want to find sponsors to give them rewards. If somebody is working on their inner well-being, let's say you did some sadhana for six months and you feel wonderful. If you feel wonderful, all the people who work with you, they'll, they'll feel wonderful. True. Your family feels wonderful. True. The world will become wonderful. This is the only way. Yes. Without individual transformation, there is no global or universal transformation. Okay. There is simply no such thing. But this is the important thing, that human beings should become a little more conscious. So as a part of this, we are launching this in 2024. Right now, preparatory work is going on because we were depending on cryptocurrency. Okay. So I'm just going to stop right there. I, I wholeheartedly uh, agree with him that, you know, it, uh, the, the global transformation starts with us, you know, with me, with you internally. This is why I'm also um, a life coach. Uh, I've certified um, over 10 years ago, almost now. And I wholeheartedly believe that. Also, I wholeheartedly believe in the fact that people are not broken. Uh, they just uh, need like a little guidance to you know, to unleash the potential of their life. But let's continue. Thinking we'll give crypto rewards for people. You okay, do. That's not working. No, not now. It's work. Yeah. It's gone. gone. At one time it was going. So we thought if you do 90 days of practice, we'll do one coin, mm. which will be valuable in the marketplace. So you are not paying for your, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, getting the sadhana. We are paying you for you to do the sadhana. Because you're doing sadhana, you're improving the world. In many ways, your workplace, your home, everything improves. This is the only way the world improves. Mm. So now we are looking at sponsors and other things to find a ways to sponsor people. That you are doing your sadhana, you are well, we will monitor you. There are ways, medically we can monitor you, how your blood pressure is, how you're feeling, everything. If you're like that, we reward you for that. For your health and well-being, we're going to reward you. With doctors and scientists involved no, in this project? No, all digitally. All digitally. All digitally. Simple. See, today you have uh, like wristbands which will tell you what is your pulse rate, Correct. what is your blood pressure. What is your sugar? They're able to kind of, yeah. maybe not exactly, but they're able to do this. So with that kind of instrumentation, with phones, phone is the main instrument. Through that, we want to monitor. Still, this work is going on. Okay. It is still technology needs to be built up. But basic technology is there. We are not inventing anything. We have to innovate a little bit to make that happen. Right. So creating a conscious planet is the most important thing. At least two to three billion people, if they are willing to spend 12 to 15 minutes within themselves and improve themselves, it's a better world. And it's the only world we have, right? So we have to work towards <laughs> That's it. That's all we have. Right. Thank you so much, Sadhguruji, for speaking with Thank us. Thank you very much. And it's been an illuminating conversation and will get us all thinking a lot about it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Wow, what an amazing conversation. I just have taken like pages of notes and I loved it. I never really follow, like, if I, I would have followed Sadhguru, but I never followed him maybe that closely. So it was very interesting for me to see things that he's revealed about his life. He talks about like, how critical he is, which is, which is very, it kind of reminds me of me. This is why I'm, uh, where it really like stuck with me. Um, uh, the, the way you kind of look into a world that you really evaluate everything. So it was really, really fascinating. And, um, um, I think I will maybe first come to the last part of the video, which where he's talking about the mental health and mental health issues. And and I'm very, very curious because um, Sadhguru talks about what I like to call practical spirituality, uh, which is, you know, taking those concepts and, and, you know, showing people like how to live a better, more fulfilled life. And I kind of wonder because... Um, Obviously, you have a very rich kind of spiritual history. Like, is India facing any of a mental health crisis or anything like that? Is that is it a thing? Is this, you know, um, something that you guys uh, work on? The reason why I'm asking is because in the West, this is a big thing. This is why I think he is also popular in the West because it's just the practicality of things and how he talks. So I'm very curious, like how he's perceived it in India and how you perceive the whole mental health conversation. Is this even a conversation in India? So that, that that's one thing. And um, um, uh, I'm, I'm genuinely just very curious, like what are the things, maybe let me know in the comments, uh, what did you take out of this video? What were maybe the three things? Um, so for me, I think what stood out with me was uh, they, they had a really long conversation about magic. 
And uh, Sadhguru talked about life being a miracle and how we, you know, think about magic as in taking out uh, like a pigeon out of your pocket. But it's really, if you think about it, how every little detail in life works. And, you know, we perhaps don't appreciate enough the magic of life itself. And I pretty much, uh, pretty much love that as well as when he says that the law, a lot, um, the life is a phenomena and we kind of need to, to write it. And um, another thing for me, it's kind of the re emphasis where he was talking about like he just wants his purpose. So you would say Dharma, I would say purpose uh, is to uh, help people to live fulfilled life. And this is kind of what, what he's after. And uh, I would love to know in the comments below, what do, you, what do you see as being your Dharma or being your purpose in maybe the way that uh, as that guru explained that. I really like where he talked uh, when she asked him about where is your home. So where do you consider your home to be? It was interesting that he said that his home is inside of him and that uh, obviously you can tell that he's just very, you know, very, very experienced, strongly spiritual person, very self-centered in himself. And he said, home is in me. I never actually heard that before. Um, I think that uh, we like to say your home is where your heart is. So perhaps uh, that's maybe a literal, literal thing. But the concept of home is uh, something very, very interesting. Uh, so... And uh, I, I like uh, the fact that he's uh, he's talking about calling out that, you know, we are our own creators. We are responsible for our life and for our actions. And we are very powerful beings. And uh, uh, I love that. Uh, love that reminder. So I believe this is it for me for today's video. I hope you enjoyed a longer format. Let me know any feedback on 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 the longer format, if I should have chopped it in, in different uh, pieces and maybe post separately or this, this works too. Um, and with that being said, uh, I really hope you have a wonderful rest of your day wherever you are. I'm wishing you so much love and please do like, share and subscribe to this channel if you like the content and I will see you in the next video. Until then, you do take care, sending much, much love. Bye-bye.